this week on ACT OUT. It's our end of the year best of episode. And since we only have half an hour, even a little less, there's no way that we could possibly cover all of the incredible people and places and stories that we've talked about in 2017. This is but a snippet, a little window into the people and the stories that we talked about in 2017. And you can find the complete episodes and more episodes that we didn't have time to cover by visiting occupy.com slash act out. Also by visiting freespeech.org as we are also syndicated on free speech TV. Hopefully this episode will give you some inspiration for the fight and build efforts coming up in 2018. So from tweets to marching in the streets, this is Act Out, best of 2017. I think the lack of solidarity with people who are willing to engage in more radical tactics um, by people who are who don't feel comfortable right. with doing it themselves is a big problem. In the book, it um, you wrote, the West wages war on the Islamic State but shakes hands with Saudi Arabia. Talk about that. Well, I think there's a very strange and fine line that the U.S. tries to play. On the one hand. Uh, pretending that it's trying to uh, take out extremism around the world, but of course a lot of this extremism is a result of U.S. policy, like the U.S. invasion of Iraq or the drone wars, uh, and in addition to that, providing the weapons to Saudi Arabia and Saudi Arabian government and the CIA working very closely, and then these weapons end up in the hands of al-Qaeda affiliates in Syria and Iraq and Libya, uh, and... Um, it did turn out through uh, leaked cables that Hillary Clinton knew uh, well that the Saudis were not only uh, spreading this extremist ideology, but were actually funding right. the extremist groups like ISIS, and that it wasn't just individuals who happened to be Saudis, it was the Saudi government. So it's just me, you, and my notebook talking about impeaching Trump. Because I know I agree. I would also love to see him not be president anymore, but it's really not that simple because the system, as the systems are wont to do, has a backup plan. It has 18 backup plans, as a matter of fact. So here are 18 reasons why you don't want to impeach Trump. Number one, Mike Pence has said that the Bible is his favorite book. I'm only assuming that's because he's never actually read a different book. You know, the Bible, the book that's filled with rape and incest and death and destruction and hate. Yeah, that book. He's anti-gay, anti-woman, I guess he would be if he loves the Bible. Anti-immigration, loves the Koch brothers, and boy, do they love him. Doesn't believe in climate change, although I guess I shouldn't even have to say that because Republicans don't. Famously said that, I think the science is very mixed on the subject of global warming. Hmm. 97% dumb shit, 3% religious nutbag, mix and serve over ice. Two, Paul Ryan. 
he's he's just a he's just one of my favorites. He believes that embryos should have personhood, but not women, as was evidenced by his support of the Let Women Die Act, which is exactly what it sounds like. The idea that a woman should be allowed to die if she needs an emergency abortion in order to save her life, because fucking embryos. Believes himself to be a good Catholic and supports the war machine, wants more military spending, of course, but um, also wants to gut Medicaid, also wants to defund Pell Grants and welfare programs. He believes that marriage is the answer to solving poverty. Also believes that black people don't like to work. Three, Senate President Pro Tempore Orrin Hatch. If you haven't heard of him, He's just one of those old crusty white guys that is like literally grown into his chair and hasn't moved in the past 40 years. His brain also hasn't moved, possibly longer than 40 years. Another anti-woman penis wrinkle, doesn't believe in contraception, no funding for abortions, anti-gay, anti-civil rights, but did vote for a constitutional ban on flag desecration, America. Pro-cop, pro-corporations, was very pro-TPP. Pro-oil, pro-charter school, leave those kids behind. Anti-Muslim, pro-gun, anti-immigration, fuck poor people, and move the Israeli uh, embassy to Jerusalem. So our organization, um, the National War Tax Resistance Coordinating Committee, or NUTRIC, uh, we support folks who refuse federal taxes. And the reason for that being is that um, the federal income tax is has been the focus of where most of the military spending comes from there are some state funds like national guard and what have you but for the most part um the military industrial complex comes out of the federal budget um, and so that has been the primary focus of our resistance and the work that we do there are war tax resistors that refuse state and local taxes um, for varying reasons sometimes because of money that goes to prisons or the police or other forms of oppression. Um, but our work is supporting people who um, refuse federal taxes. A lot of people don't think black people can be white supremacists. But if you think that white people are superior and that somehow or another you're the exceptional Negro, then you are a white supremacist. And we are the 99%, for goodness sakes, what do we have to do? We have to unite. How can we unite if we can't get along with each other? If we, if we judge every person by the color of his or her skin, we cannot. We, we have to unite to, to move on this government. And no, I don't believe in voting because what are you voting for? We've been, I think that's, that's why we have this hor horrific government in place now is because we've been vo voting for the lesser of two evils for hundreds of years and what are we voting for? We're voting for evil. We need to slash fossil fuel emissions. We need to um, deploy technologies to remove CO2 from the atmosphere. So lower CO2 levels, which would lower ocean acidification levels. And we also need to look at ways, deploy things to cool the Arctic. Because if we go from an Arctic snow covered, ice covered Arctic to an Arctic with completely no ice on the ocean year round or snow up on cover year round, then the carbon that is stored in the permafrost, both on land and in the seafloor, will start coming up in large quantities, um, strengthening the warming. Also, we will lose ice very rapidly from Greenland and sea level rise will, will spike upwards as well. And then once they spike upwards from Greenland, then they will under they will cause problems to ice caps also on, on Antarctica. Black Americans have always led in the fight for human rights, their own and for other people. And we have lost that in this rightward lurch, in uh, our so-called leaders, as we call them, the black misleadership class, um, uh, such as uh, elected officials and, and others who used to be stalwarts uh, in the issues that I've uh, discussed, but uh, now de depend on patronage or on staying in office. And, um, you know, it used to be uh, before uh, Obama was uh, elected, uh, black people used to talk about the possibility. Could it ever happen? Would it ever happen that we would see a black president? And I started to think about it. And I said, well, considering what you have to do to become president, is this something I would want to see? Um, you know, presidents, Nobody gets that job who is not beholden to corporate interests. 
uh, not beholden to uh, the military industrial complex. And to have a person like that, but just with brown skin, was not something that uh, I found uh, appealing in the slightest. Uh, in addition to that, in order to be uh, elected president, there has to be a distancing of, uh, from Black America, from our needs. So Republicans, Democrats all find ways to either ignore us or to um, overtly attack us. And Obama was no different in that regard with his constant scolding, with his criticisms of, uh, of Black people. Uh, he said things that a white person would never have been able to get away with. Uh, I'm going to say this very trite phrase, but the, the points are very salient in it. Dream the future, know your history, organize your people, and fight to win. If we, if we use that framing, then we are there. But what we, what we don't do, never do, is dream of what the future can look like. It's, that's what was so amazing about the Zapatistas when they rose up in the 90s, is that they offered a dream. They said, we are dreaming the future, and now we're trying to live that dream as much as we can. We don't, as activists in the United States, don't do that at all. We are so busy resisting, resisting, rebelling, rebelling, resisting, struggle, struggle. Look at the language that we use. That's all we ever talk about. When I ask people, I, you know, I speak to thousands of people. And when I ask, when, I, when I'm in a room full of hundreds of people, and I say, what can we do? Nobody can dream beyond a year or two or a campaign. It's hard for people to go like, well, what could it look like in five years? What could it look like in 10 years? And I don't say that we're building a master plan. This is not like uh, planned economies and things. I'm just saying like, but what do you want? Because if that question, what do I want to do and how do I want to get there is a much different question. It puts me on different paths than saying, I have got to resist this. I have to struggle against this because what happens is that we become the fire brigades and we just end up putting out fire after fire after fire. One, it doesn't matter whether we call it anarchy or not or anarchism. I give no shits about that. In fact, I fucking hate it. We called it blue potato. I'm very cool with that. What it matters is what, how we engage with each other and how we do these things and the, how, the, I, the way that we, 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 we see the world, the broad spectrum of seeing the world. Um, the second part of that is that I... I think that we should stop trying to convert people. Fuck, man, we're not a religion, man. Not just anarchists, activists, anybody. We don't hold any moral authority over anybody. If we were going to build politics and philosophy on ethics, that's anarchy. And so to me, it's like I don't want to convert anybody, so I don't have to. So then I don't have I, – I meet them where they're at because that's where our commonality is. And then if I want people to come along on the road or ask me about the road that I'm on, then – what I do is I start talking about it, but I show them. You, we, if we do by showing, it means way more than do by talking. Do by talking is the, is the whole world. There's a million shows you can talk about things. There's a million books. There's a million things where we can talk about things. But if we do, that is so far less than, than that. And so in my whole life, I've always wanted to build the future I want, I want people to live in so they can see it and go, that makes sense in my life. Or that could, how could I do that in my life? That is way that has been far more powerful than ever trying to win an ideological argument with somebody or to see myself as more superior than them, that I have some special information that I am. I just have fucking I'm a I'm a high school dropout. But somewhere along the way, I got technical language to talk about this certain set of ideas. It doesn't make me a fucking any smarter than anybody else. And I ask myself because my mom is not an anarchist. She's not conservative. She's very radical in ideas. But does it make sense to my mom? Does it make sense to my family? you know, like to my larger extended family. Um, and if they can get on board with it, even if they don't agree with everything, that's, that's a, that is uh, as far as a close of a win as I'm ever going to get, because I'm not going to try to debate them to death. And so what was then announced in 2005 as democratic confederalism is something like an alternative economic, political, social, cultural system, which opposes the state um, as a viable political model for the people in the region uh, on the idea that um, if it's the same state which has perpetuated all these problems, which has resulted in an immense system of hierarchy, domination, which has drawn these borders, which has perpetuated social injustices, then maybe creating a state will not be the path to freedom. Maybe we need to do something more radical than that. Maybe we should 
radicalize our democracies, make it as participatory as possible, make it as uh, open to different identities and especially to the women's struggles as possible in order to genuinely claim ourselves to be freedom fighters. So in that sense, um, a democratic confederalism is thought of as um, as a system which is anti-capitalist, anti-statist, um, and anti-patriarchal, which poses especially, um, which especially promotes uh, ecology, women's liberation, and grassroots democracy as the alternative to the existing system. And with that comes the concepts of what Öcalan calls the democratic nation, which is basically an attempt to emancipate ourselves from the chauvinism of nation, nation states by proposing an idea of identity, of unity, which is based on shared principles, on common ideas, on um, common perspectives, such as um, coexistence, such as women's uh, liberation and so on. So that all these different identities, languages, cultures add to this diverse nation, so that the nation is no longer defined as an ethnic concept, but rather as a concept which signifies unity with all of its diversity, and which actually is stronger the more diverse it is. And lastly, also this kind of system, if it is supposed to last, it needs its form of self-defense. Um, the idea of self-defense is not only defined as a mere physical phenomenon, but at the same time, um, caring for the lands, caring for ecology, uh, caring for our culture, cultural heritage, uh, looking after um, the ancient historic sites that we have. All of this is connected and it is a form of self-defense. And especially when we look at um, what happened to other parts of uh, Kurdistan that were also attacked by ISIS compared to what happened when ISIS attacked a city like Kobani, where people were very much organized. Kobani was the first city where the uh, people um, evicted the state from, from the region. Uh, the other parts were slaughtered. They were taken over by ISIS within days, but uh, Kobani really became the symbol of hope, became the symbol of resistance against ISIS. And why? It's not because there's some something very special about the geography of that region or its people. It's because really the people were organized. They knew what to do. They knew how to cooperate. They knew how to act. They knew how to plan their lives and make sure that they can defend themselves if uh, necessary. Uh, there's institutions and there's uh, social hierarchies that um, can take really good people, people who, who you know, have, you know, what you, what you think are strong ethical values, and once you put them in a situation and you give them power, um, and an and institution encourages a certain use of that power, it doesn't matter how good you are, you're going to become bad. I fundamentally believe there's no such thing as a good cop, and if a cop ever tries to do the good thing in the moment, they very quickly find themselves being run out of the profession. We as communities, we can come together and we can address mental illness and we can support one another, um, you know, inter and everyone, not just the people who are, uh, you know, labeled as mentally ill, but everyone needs mental health uh, services. If we can focus on providing everybody with uh, the basic uh, necessities so that they can feel like they're a part of society, you know, a human society, you know, and that they can uh, contribute to their community, even, even if it's not you know, in the ways that we typically look at work, you know, that takes away a lot of, you know, the, the, that, you know, the, 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 the ingredients for crime. And then most crime happens to be between people who know each other, right? The violent crime. And so, um, and so if we can have sort of conflict resolution and we can identify problems before they become problems and we can uh, work with relationships that are abusive so that um, instead of uh, bringing it to a head, we actually get them to work through it and, if necessary, move on in a peaceful way. I think that that is essential and critical to uh, being able to effectively uh, move forward you know, with a police 
abolition sort of mindset. But but I do think it's problematic that there's a lot of people out there that say abolish police, abolish prisons, but they don't want to talk about the alternatives and they really don't want to create alternatives. And I think that's that's what's you know most important. Like you said, the line three will it'll leak in the oil into these traditional rice lakes and disturb the one of the resources for this traditional food for the Ojibwe. And that just shows how one of the ways that this pipeline will be affecting the lifestyle that we strive to bring back as indigenous people. <clears throat> and when this pipeline spills into our water sources, it will expose thousands of cancer causing chemicals. And it will also be contaminating our water, of course. And <clears throat> that's of course a resource that we all need to survive. And there are many spills that have already happened, and many gallons of oil have already contaminated our water with the oil. Like we were just talking about, like these um, these areas that there have been spills that mm -hmm. there's li like little to no life there. Like um, animals, you don't you don't, don't hear, hear you don't hear it. It's just they're, silence, they're just yeah. not there because the ground, the water that they once lived are is now poisoned so they they can't even live like nor naturally how they're supposed to it just destroys all signs of life there mm -hmm. it was the youth that started the whole thing mm -hmm. at standing rock and to kind of bridge it over to here in line 3 and to have the youth start up this this whole campaign against line 3 it it's really powerful and to have youth on the water it just it because indigenous youth have a very hard time dealing with historical trauma. That's something us indigenous people deal with, and with high suicide rates, um, high alcoholism rates, drug drug addiction. It, it's it all adds up really bad within us native youth. And to see um, native youth becoming empowered by not only being on the water, but fighting for their water, fighting for their land, fighting for their people. It's it brings the whole community up as a whole, I believe. And, and of course, have, we will be the leaders of tomorrow. All the youth will be the people leading this earth in the future. We'll be the ones directly impacted from the effects of this pipeline. So we'll be, we'll be the ones here 60 years later when that pipeline's no longer effective. So I think to have us out there speaking our voices to not only Enbridge, but the whole oil company, all these oil companies, it, Really, we make a statement as a whole. A warning sign for the Buckeye Pipeline. The Buckeye and Enterprise run along the Gerhardt's property, and as Elise Gerhardt told me, these are old pipelines that were brought back into commission with the fracking boom after the Gerhardt's bought their property in the early 1980s. You can see the shaved tree line that exposes the path of these existing pipelines. The proposed Mariner East 2 pipeline would go right alongside of them, and you can see the proposed path to the right of the existing pipeline path on the hillside. And you can see the pipeline pieces and the Gerhardt's property are the trees that you can glimpse there on the right hand side where clear cutting has already begun and where tree sits are currently taking place to protect and resist. I'm not gonna show you that for the security and safety of the camp, but this is the land that Sunoco, now Energy Transfer Partners, wants to destroy. When I said it to them, I said it to DNR, I'm saying it to DEQ if they watch this, to Army Corps, and to Governor John Bell Edwards. You have an opportunity right now to save people from the violence, from state violence. You have an opportunity to save them from false incarceration, because I'm telling you that the people of Louisiana who are involved in this, in this struggle will not go easily into the night. It's our chance to say no, and we are taking that chance with this horrible company. I don't know of another company that deserves a no more than Energy Transfer Partners. So this camp is actually movable and very well hidden. So whenever we want to go somewhere, like we pull it out, you know, whatever. We also are very other, different from other camps. We are incredibly betting about who gets to be a part of our camp and, who, and what media gets into our camp. Um, so we're a little different in that way. We're very small, too. Uh, we keep it very tight circle. That's not to say, I always said, we will not ever call 10,000 people to tromp through our swamps because it's very sensitive area. It's also inhospitable area. But uh, that's not to say that there won't be times, especially if this pipeline gets its permits, where we won't be asking people to come down and help us hold this line. It just may not be in the swamp itself. But that's the good thing about having a movable camp. 
we move. We can go wherever the fight and the struggle is. Well, here I think you can use the knowledge and tactics and skills of former military members who are committed to the movement. You know, if you don't if you don't want to be uh, attacked in the street or ambushed or hit by a sniper or so forth, and I know those things sound maybe a little out there right now, but for me, they're not. I mean, I think, again, this brings us back to the point that we should be ahead of the game. And so I think if we see things escalating, we can only assume that they'll continue to escalate. And in that context, I think it would help for people to understand how do you walk down the street? You know, how do you actually patrol? Uh, what kind of groups do you operate within? In the military, we have platoons of 45 people, squads of uh, 12 people, 13 people, with one being a, a, a squad leader. We operate in fire teams of four people. Uh, each four person fire team has a role that supports that four person fire team. Each fire team, three of which fit within each squad, support that squad. And then three squads in a platoon, each squad with three four man fire teams. And how does the, how do those three squads operate to then benefit a platoon structure of, say, 45 people? Most of the anthropologists that I read, uh, it's it's clear to them over time that that's like the sort of optimal group number. It's like that we're used to for our 200,000 years have been operating in these groups of like 45 or 50 people. And I think it's manageable and I've seen it managed in real time under extremely stressful situations. Um, now, how do you, as we've been talking about, you don't always want to be in that sort of war mindset and you don't always want your organization to be structured as such. So then I think the challenge for us is even if we implement some of those skills and tactics of the military, it is then how do we then retransition back to a non-military setting? De Cuba traigo el son ritmo sabroso. De Cuba dulce caña y rico ron. Café como no hay otro en el Caribe. El más chiflado golpe del bongo. Por Cuba tengo la sangre caliente. We got 